Brother? All right, I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. You found your place there. If you would stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God, Romans 15. Just going to read two verses this morning. Romans 15, and starting at verse number 12, the Bible says this And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Amen. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You may Amen. be seated. Now this is a bit of a different message that I'm going to preach to you this morning. Normally I would go through verses like these and exposit them and try to provide you all the context and interpretation and application, so on and so forth. But what I want to do today is not to exhaust these two verses in Romans 15, but I want to focus very specifically on a central message found here in this text. And I want to examine the prayer of the Apostle Paul in verse 13. And the question that we will seek to answer is this, for what exactly is Paul praying? What does Paul mean when he asks God to fill the Roman believers with joy and peace that they may abound in hope? Amen. Now, perhaps some of you will not agree with what I believe this prayer entails. And that's all right. I understand that perhaps the way I view Paul's prayer here is not common in a lot of our churches today. And if you don't agree, that's fine, but I believe that I'll be able to present uh, enough scripture to you this morning and enough historical context to at least give you something to think about. Amen. And I want to submit to you that in verse 13, the Apostle Paul is praying for God's people to have a victorious eschatology. Now let's, let's define some terms. But when Paul says, may the God... of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe Paul's praying for God to fill them and to give them a victorious eschatology. Well, what do I mean? Well, let's define some of those terms there. Well, the word eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or last things, and right. the word ology, which simply means the study of. So the word eschatology simply means the study of last things. Now, it's helpful to understand that the different views of eschatology are typically defined by what they teach concerning the return of Christ as it relates to the millennium. Within Orthodox Christianity, there are several views. For instance, there are premillennialists, and a premillennialist believes that the return of Christ comes before or pre the millennium. Uh, there are post-millennialists who, as you might assume, believe that the return of Christ comes post or after the millennium. Right. Then there's amillennialists who believe that the millennium is really uh, a spiritual event that describes our present day condition. And uh, really they're kind of a, a, a form of post-millennialism because they believe Christ will return at the end of that spiritualized millennium. And then with all of these categories... There are a number of camps and additional variations within them. For example, within premillennialism, you have dispensational premillennialism, and you have historic premillennialism. So what I'm simply saying to you is this. It's very complicated when we start to look at all of these different views and all of these different systems. And my goal, however, is not to deal with all of the different views and schemes of eschatology this morning. That would be nearly impossible to do in a single message. But the crux of my message is this. If you don't leave with anything else, leave with this. Whatever your eschatological position is, 
whether you are premillennial or postmillennial, dispensational, historic, whatever it is, you are to have a position in accordance with the prayer of the Apostle Paul that is categorized by eventual and ultimate victory. Mm -hmm. See, in Romans 15, Paul refers to the Lord as the God of hope. And he does so in verse 13 after quoting in verse 12 an Old Testament prophecy that foretells of the supreme success that Jesus Christ is to have in the redemption and restoration of all things. Amen. Paul reasons like this. Because Jesus Christ will ultimately be victorious in time and in history, on earth as well as in eternity, this victory makes God the God of hope. Amen. And he then prays that God's people would abound in this hope. So let's answer the question we asked earlier. What does it mean for God's people to abound in hope? Well, it means that we are to think of the future in terms of and live our day-to-day -day lives in light of the victory that is promised to Jesus Christ, His gospel, and His people. Amen. Abounding in hope and having a victorious eschatology means that despite what is going on in the world around us, we as Christians have a bright outlook on the future. Amen. Because we trust the Word of God over the signs of the times. Right. In other words, we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. Furthermore, a victorious eschatology means that, listen to this, we do not expect, we do not pessimistically expect things to just get worse and worse until the coming of the Lord. But with a spirit of optimism, we expect great things to be done in the advancement of Christ and His kingdom. We believe that because Jesus Christ has come into the world, and because His gospel is being preached in the world, it is absolutely impossible for the world to not be blessed by the proclamation of God's Word. Now I know the, the popular message in our time is, well, it's just... It's just going to get worse and worse. Perilous times shall come. And there's nothing we can do about it. Evil men shall wax worse and worse. But we have to realize that those promises were real in Paul's day. Right. That there were perilous times in Paul's day. There were evil men in Paul's day. See, that's, a, that's an ongoing reality. But in spite of that reality, the Apostle Paul and believers down through the ages have always held on to the hope that through all that bad stuff going on in the world, there would be ultimate victory in time for the Lord Jesus Christ, His gospel, His kingdom, and His people. Amen. Now I want to demonstrate this victorious eschatology in three ways. I want to show you, number one, a victorious eschatology in the promises of the Scriptures. Secondly, I want to show you a victorious eschatology as we see it in the past. And then I want to show you a victorious eschatology in practice, in your everyday life. After all, what good would any eschatological position be if it did not in some way shape the way you live and help you right. walk the day-to-day -day life Amen. if you're to walk as a believer? So number one, I want to look at the promises from the Scriptures. The faithfulness of God and the power of God are intimately connected with the promises of God. Amen. See, if God fails to keep His promises, He ceases to be God. Right. And there are an abundance of scriptures and a plethora of promises in God's Word that present a victorious eschatology. And we don't have time this morning to look at all of them. We'll only be able to look at a few. And I want to show you some that, that highlight central aspects to the victory that we are to expect as God's people. Firstly, I want you to see the promise of His reign. If you would, turn to Daniel chapter number 7. Daniel 7. I want to show you the promise of Christ's reign. His reign. <laughs> now, 
there in Daniel 7, beginning with verse 13, the Bible says this. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His Amen. dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. These verses undergird the promise of the universal and almighty reign of King Jesus. Amen. Matthew Henry says of these verses that the kingdom of the Messiah shall be set up and kept up in the world in spite of all opposition of the powers of darkness. Amen. Let the heathen rage and fret as long as they please. God will set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. Amen. See, when we think of the kingdom, the timing and the extent of Christ's reign, it would be right to think of it in these ways. See, the kingdom has come because the king has come. Amen. And the kingdom is here because the king is ruling and reigning. And the kingdom will come more fully, more visibly, and more personally because the king is coming again. Amen. So I shun any kind of theology that seeks to tell me that Christ presently has no kingdom. That Christ presently is awaiting a kingdom, but uh, this world is just over the sovereign rule of Satan. I reject any kind of theology like that. Because Daniel prophesied that his kingdom was an everlasting kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. Amen. See, the kingship of Christ is intimately connected with the very person of Christ. If he is not king, he ceases to be all who he is. Mm -hmm. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Now we said that the kingdom has come in the past, and we said that the kingdom will come when he comes again. So that means that we are in the already not yet. We are in that present kingdom of our Lord, which is distinct from the future kingdom that will come. So you might say, well, what are the characteristics of this kingdom to come? What is, as king, what is Jesus Christ presently doing? Well, Paul answers that for us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, and look at verse 24. Then cometh the end. Well, what is this? The end, the end of the world, the end of this present kingdom, at the inauguration and conception of this coming kingdom, then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Amen. Watch this in verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Amen. Say, what is Jesus Christ doing right now as king? According to verse 25, he is right now, as we gather here this morning, he is putting his enemies under his feet. Mm -hmm. This spells out the central objective and progression of Christ's kingdom in the here and now, in the already, in the all, uh, in the not yet, by the preaching of his gospel, in converting grace, by the exaltation of his word, he is conquering his enemies this morning. Amen. You say, well, it just doesn't seem that way. You say, it doesn't look like Christ is going and reigning. So it looks like the wicked are waxing worse and worse. How do you expect me to believe that Christ is currently defeating his enemies when it seems like Christ is losing ground and the kingdom of God is, is losing territory? Well, you're not alone in, in these conundrums. See, David asked these same questions. Turn over to Psalm chapter number 2. I warned you that we'd be looking at a lot of scripture this morning. And in Psalm chapter number 2, David, as it were, asked the same problem. He has the same issue, that he knows there is a 
king that has a kingdom, but he does not understand how this kingdom could come <coughs> in such power that he had heard about in the Old Testament. And David says this in Psalm chapter number 2, Psalm 2. He says, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What is David saying? He's saying, all these earthly rulers, the principalities of this world, the kingdom of darkness, they're, they're, they're gathering together and they're forming this coalition of evil against the Lord and his kingdom. What does David say under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in verse number 4? But he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. David says, so what if the liberals take over the White House? Mm -hmm. So what if it looks like our churches are falling away. Mm -hmm. So what if it looks like the laws in this country are promoting wickedness and suppressing righteousness? David says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Amen. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Now, it doesn't look that way from our finite point of view. Right. What, what is a man's life? It's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. But from the standpoint, from the viewpoint of an almighty, omnipotent, eternal God, he laughs right. when he sees that foolish rebellion. And watch this. Verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Amen. In other words, it doesn't matter who the kingdom of Satan has as its rulers and its leaders and its conquerors. He has already set his king upon right. the holy hill of Zion. Verse 7, And I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. It's the father talking to the son. Mm -hmm. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Do you realize that because of the kingdom that has been given to the Lord Jesus, all he has to say is, Father, I want that. Mm -hmm. And it shall be given to him. So what, what does God have to do to turn a country around? Mm -hmm. All it takes is Jesus Christ saying to the Father, Father, I want that. Yep. And it's given to him. It's, it's that way in our salvation. Father, I want that sinner. Well, ask of me and I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance. Right. It's that way for countries. It's that way for nations. He says in the uttermost part of the earth. Well, see, sometimes we get into this mindset that there's just certain places uh, they'll just never have a gospel preaching church. Uh, the, the word of God will just never find any success there. But all it takes is for Jesus Christ to say, Father, I want that. Mm -hmm. Are we praying that way with that in mind? See, I, I fear that our prayers are far too self-centered. Right. We pray about what we want to help us in a hard situation, uh, but we don't pray that the will of God might turn the situation as a whole. Mm -hmm. Imagine if Jesus Christ were to say right now to the Father, Father, I want Dover, Tennessee. Mm. Amen. What would happen? Well, the Father would give it to him. And we need to stop thinking as if that were such a wild-eyed impossibility. Right. Especially when we've seen Christ do that in times past. Do you realize that several hundred years ago on this continent, there was nothing but pagan savages roaming this land? No, right. no light of the gospel whatsoever. Now, has America ever been fully Christianized? Absolutely not. 
But is, is it appropriate to say that there came a day when Jesus Christ looked upon this new world and he says, Father, I want that. Mm -hmm. And what happened? God sent the gospel to this continent. That's it. Now we have churches. Now we have preachers. Now we have a testimony for the gospel of God. That's it. Amen. And because his kingdom doesn't pass away, because it's promised to progressively expand and expand, we have no reason to think that more evangelism, more converts, more preaching of the gospel would not produce even greater glory and works for the Lord. In fact, Jesus has such a mighty reign that even the wickedness of man ultimately results in his glory. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, Psalm 76 and verse 10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. I have a friend in South Georgia, a preacher brother by the name of John Weaver. And one time a man walked up to Brother Weaver, and Brother Weaver, uh, he's, he's a funny man. You just have to meet him. But they were going on and on about just how bad things were becoming. All the politics, all the elections, all this, all that. He said, Brother Weaver, everything is just going wrong. Brother Weaver looked up and said, Ah, you're right. Everything is going wrong just right. That's it. Amen. Say, how much evil and wickedness will continue to exist in this world? According to Psalm 76 and verse 10, just enough to ultimately redound to the glory of God. Of God. Amen. Even the wrath of man shall praise thee. And in the rest of that wrath thou shalt restrain. This is the promise of our Lord's sovereign and victorious reign. He has a kingdom. His kingdom has been established in this world. By regeneration, you have been translated into that kingdom. Amen. And your king does not give you any leniency to have an ounce of pessimism when you think of what he has done. It's the promise of his reign. I want you to see, secondly, the promise of his redemption. The promise of his redemption. Look over at Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah 53. And this is a very well-known portion of Scripture. The, the passage of the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, the Bible says this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Right. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Amen. And he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he Amen. shall bear their iniquities. Amen. Oh, if we could start having the confidence in Jesus Christ Amen. that his own father has in his son. Right. If we could have the, the confidence in the gospel that God has in the Oh, how that would revolutionize our praying. Right. Oh, how that would revolutionize our preaching. Oh, how that would revolutionize our walking by faith. Another promise concerning the victory of Jesus Christ. Christ will not only be glorified in his kingdom, but he shall be satisfied. Amen. In the redemption, as all for whom he died shall be eternally saved. That's right. Amen. Have you ever thought of yourself as bringing satisfaction to Jesus Christ? Hmm. Can you imagine the Son of God looking down upon you, seeing how His grace has saved you and changed your life, saying, Father, I'm so satisfied. Brother Larry, can you imagine Jesus looking down upon you and in heaven saying, I'm so satisfied when I see Him? Hmm. There was a time when God was angry with you every day. Mm -hmm. 
But now, by His grace, He looks upon you, and He is satisfied. He's won the victory over your life. That's it. He's victorious. And you say, how does He accomplish this redemption? How does He transform lives to His satisfaction? Turn over just a couple chapters to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 and verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, Amen. but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. We need to start having a shall theology. Amen. God says, when I send rain, the rain does not just come back to me like I sent it. No, but it goes into the earth and it accomplishes something. It produces fruit and vegetation and it nourishes the seed. He said, so too is my word. Amen. When I send my word out, it does not just come back to me void. No, but it goes into the hearts of those that I have purposed to save. And Amen. it quickens their heart just like the rain quickens the ground. And the seed of the gospel yields fruit unto life in their heart. That's, it. That's Amen. how it accomplishes it. And he says that it shall happen. It shall be done. Amen. Here we find another promise. One that assures us that the word of God, being powerful and effectual, will succeed in all its intention. He is successful in his kingdom. He's successful in his redemption. He's successful in his word. He Amen. is victorious. Amen. And if we're going to do a work for the kingdom of God, it must be done through the might of this victorious word. That's it. See, someone broke into my home, and I met them in the living room was my AR-15. And if they began to ridicule my gun, saying, oh, don't you know that's made out of a bunch of cheap plastic parts, and that thing malfunctions half the time you shoot it, that ammo's no good either. Well, I would not hold that gun up and say, no, you're all wrong. This is some of the finest American machinery. This is a, a tested, and, and see what I'm saying? No, I, I would simply just aimed at them and pressed the trigger. And they'd soon find out if it works. Right. So you see, how, how do we reach the community for the Lord Jesus? How do we do a work for God? Mm -hmm. How do we build churches? How do we save lives? How do we change families? How do we develop ministries? We simply aim the scriptures Amen. and press the trigger. And the word of God shall accomplish all that the Lord Jesus seeks to do. That's it. That's the promise of his redemption. The third promise that undergirds our victorious eschatology is the promise of his restoration. Amen. The promise of his restoration. It was popular radio Bible teacher, J. Vernon McGee, that once said this, you don't polish brass on a sinking ship. Hmm. Well, there's several problems with that. Number one, this world is not a ship. And number two, this world is not going down with the wicked. All right. Turn over to Romans chapter number eight. Romans chapter number eight. The promise of his redemption. See, what's plagued our churches here in America is we have this theology that the wicked are going down and the world is going down with it and all of the institutions of this world are going down and our only hope is to somehow be rescued out of this world. But I submit to you that Jesus Christ has not saved you so that he could just take you out of this world, but he has saved you so that he can save the world through you. Amen. And he has decreed to reach this world by making his people extensions of himself. Look at Romans 8, verse 19. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, 
not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The Bible says that Jesus, that God was in Jesus Christ reconciling all things unto himself. Now, he will restore this world. And he will destroy it by fire. But that will not be a destruction unto the end, but it will be a restoration, a remodeling. And he will reign with his saints throughout all eternity on a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. This world's not going down to the wicked. Satan will not have ultimate victory over this world. Jesus Christ will have ultimate victory over this world and all who live in it. You say he's conquering his foes. He is making his enemies his footstool. Well, you know, there's really two ways that you can conquer an enemy. The first is by destruction. You can destroy him. You can annihilate him. You can kill him. And Jesus Christ will do that with many unbelievers. But the second way that you can conquer an enemy is to make him your friend. And Jesus Christ does this has he not done this with us, as Ephesians says, you who were sometimes afar off, you were an enemy of God, and he hath made you nigh, mm -hmm. he hath made you a friend, and he has conquered you in that manner. We've seen the promise of his reign, we've seen the promise of his redemption, we've seen the promise of his restoration. And let me just submit to you that there's no room for pessimism in light of God's promises. We have a victorious eschatology because Christ is our victor. And just in case you're still doubting me, just in case you're saying, well, I don't know if those promises really mean what they say they mean because we can't see them all with the physical eye, let me just remind you that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men Count slackness, but he is faithful to us for it. Amen. See, walking by faith means standing on these promises, regardless of what you see with the physical eye. You will not find a victorious eschatology in the New York Times. Right. Only in the pages of God's true and holy word. That's it. That is a victorious eschatology in the promises of the scriptures. And very quickly, I'm going to show you a victorious eschatology in the past. In the past. Now, we do not base our doctrine on history alone. Just because Christians have done something does not mean we should continue to do it if it doesn't line up with the Bible. Amen. However, when a doctrine has been believed and accepted and practiced by many Christians down through the ages, we ought to be very careful before we reject it. Amen. You know, it amazes me how something that was the standard for nearly 2,000 years can be lost in a single generation. Right. Uh, there's many rabbit holes we could go down on that thought this morning, could we not? I, I mean, the elements of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. For nearly 2,000 years, all Christians universally understood what those elements were. Right. For nearly 2,000 years... Uh, virtually all Christians understood that men should dress like men and women should dress like women. Right. For nearly 2,000 years, Christians believed in the preservation of the text of Scripture, which was known as the received text. But only in the last 50 to 100 have we seen these cardinal doctrines now receive so much challenge and criticism. Right. Well, I want to submit that it's really the same with the victorious eschatology. See, in the last 100 years, we have left an eschatology of victory and adopted an eschatology of defeat. Mm -hmm. We have right. gone from optimism to pessimism. And we seem to be masochistically enjoying having ourselves dominated and ruled over by the wicked. Amen. What's especially ironic is that this defeated eschatology is especially popular here in America. A place where Christianity has 
prospered and flourished more than anywhere else in the world. <clears throat> Yet we are some of the most defeated and pessimistic people. Now there's a number of reasons for this dramatic shift. But the chief reason, I believe, is that we have become extremely near-sighted. See, when someone says that things are becoming hopelessly worse and worse, what they are doing is making an observation based on the last 50 or 60 years. But they fail to realize that Christianity did not begin 50 years ago, or even 100 years ago. See, in order to have a victorious eschatology, you must understand that Christianity began 2,000 years ago. Amen. And when you take into consideration all of Christian history, it is impossible to deny the progressive victory and expansion of Christ's kingdom. New Testament Christianity began with 12 men in an attic. And of those 12 men, 11 of them were violently martyred. One of them was persecuted and boiled alive in chicken grease right. before he was exiled to the island of Patmos. For the first couple of centuries of Christianity, it was nearly universally illegal. Christians were thrown into Colosseums to be eaten by lions right. as the heathens cheered. Believers were persecuted for having the word of God and put to death for translating it into their native tongues. Yep. Say, so where are we today? Well, today we have the freedom to assemble. Today we have the freedom of reading a nice leather-bound copy of the Bible. We have the freedom to listen to thousands of hours of preaching on the internet. Yep. And you, you mean to tell me that things have gotten so much worse and worse since the time of the apostles? Hmm. No, Christ has experienced great victory. Right. Now, certainly I realize that there is still persecution in this world. And, you know, people often love to quote that Christians are being martyred more now than ever. But you know, do you know why that is? Because there are more Christians now than ever. In the times of the apostles, there were, there were no Christians in Asia. We look at the Chinese church, and, and the church in China is being persecuted and killed. But, but why is that? That's because Christ's gospel has shed light in one of the hardest to reach places, humanly speaking, and there are believers to persecute. That's it. Yeah. That's victory. Mm -hmm. That's not defeat. That's victory. Amen. So rather than bemoaning the wickedness of our day, we ought to praise God for the undeniable expansion and blessings of his kingdom. Amen. And you know what? If these promises are true, you know what that means for those believers in China? That that persecution will only go on so long until Jesus Christ finally says, Father, I ha I've had enough. I want all of it. Give all of it to me. Uh, we know that he's promised to perpetuate his church, right? Amen. But nowhere does it say he's promised to do that in Tennessee. That's it. And I'm not ruling out the fact that God could raise up faithful believers to be a sending hub of missionaries, to be a, a place where others can come to learn the Lord Jesus Christ anywhere in this Amen. world. See, this was the outlook of men of God in the past who did great works for the Lord Jesus. It was William Carey, the Baptist missionary, who said, The future is as bright as the promise of God. Amen. See, when he went to India, he, he, he didn't think he was polishing brass on a sinking ship. <laughs> but he went to India, believing the promises of God, that he could preach the gospel to those heathen, and God would save them, because there were those there on that continent for whom Christ died. Amen. And with a spirit of optimism, with an eschatology of victory, he went to India confident that God would convert the natives. Amen. Listen to what the Baptist theologian John Gill had to say about the success of the gospel and the victory of Christ in time and in history. He says this, The gospel will have a greater spread than now. At present times, it lies in a narrow compass, chiefly in the isles, very little on the continent and in the countries where it is, but it is but in few places there. But hereafter, many will run to and fro, and knowledge, evangelical knowledge, will be increased, and the earth shall be full of it, as
as the waters cover the sea, the, the angel or a set of gospel ministers shall have it to preach to every nation, kindred and tongue and people. Amen. See, we look at the days of John Gill through a romanticized lens, and we think, well, what a grand day that was for those particular Baptists in England. Their theology was so rich, and look where we are today. But John Gill envisioned, even from his day, looking forward, that the gospel would do far greater things than what he had experienced. Amen. Imagine if we started thinking that way. Imagine if we started thinking, well, it's coming. Persecution's coming. It's going to get bad. It's going to... Imagine if we started thinking... Who knows what great things the Lord could do from this Amen. Who knows what he could do because he's promised to do them. This is the mindset of God's people. This is the outlook of those that have done great works for God. See, we are too easy to give up hope. We are too soon to quit. Amen. We preach and we evangelize and when we don't see immediate converts, when we don't see the fruit, we say, well, this is because the world is getting worse and worse. This is because the world is getting more wicked. There's nothing we can do about it. We must realize that when we go out and evangelize, when we do ministry, we're not planting cabbage. We're planting oaks. Mm. And it may be long after I am gone before I see the fruit of the seed that I have sown. Right. But I trust the promises of God over my own efforts. And Lord, give us patience and determination to keep plowing that field, even when it seems like we're getting no crop. Right. And lastly, as we close, I want to show you this victorious eschatology in practice. In other words, now that we've looked at all of these promises, we've looked at the history of the views of God's people in the past, how should we now live? Amen. Well, I hope you've seen the importance and the necessity to have a victorious eschatology. See, your eschatology determines how you live and how you will live. Your eschatology shapes and forms your worldview. Yep. And if you are going to do a lasting work for God, we must do so with the hope of eventual victory. See, this short-term thinking, the doom, gloom, and despair thinking, has produced a generation of Christian losers. Yep. Uh, let's go out and lose this one for Jesus, is the rallying cry of the churches in this country today. See, if we're going to be successful, we must think long term. Mm -hmm. Why invest in a work for God if it will never succeed? Right. A victorious eschatology is essential when it comes to training the next generation. Then, see, this was the heart of the message for me. This is what prompted me to think on some of these things. As we begin to think about a classical Christian school and begin to think about training up young people in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we must have the hope that God can do a work that will affect generation after generation. Amen. That's the reason why I'm so passionate about it. Because I, I don't just want to do something that will be a blessing for us in the next five years or in the next ten years. But I want to do something that in 50 years, 100 years, or even 1,000 years, it will still be glorifying the Lord Jesus. Amen. And he can still be using it to use, reach countless souls for the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. A victorious eschatology. Christ shall be victorious. And in Luke chapter 19 and verse 13, Jesus taught his disciples through a parable. He says this, Occupy till I come. Good. This literally means that we are to be doing business until the Lord returns. See, sometimes we use that old adonym, well, no man knoweth the, the hour. We use that as a cloak to teach everyone that it's going to happen tomorrow. Hmm. And the message of the churches in America for the last 50 years ha has essentially been go out and bury that talent in your backyard mm. because things are just so uncontrollably evil that surely the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. Mm. What if we're at the beginning of Christian history? What if we ain't seen nothing yet? Mm. Pardon my grammar. And what if the Lord is pleased to tarry and pleased to allow the gospel to be preached to many, many generations, well, we're to occupy till he comes. Amen. We are not called to be idle. We are not called to quit. We are not to worry. We are not to dismay. We are certainly not to lock ourselves in the church and just pray for the Lord Jesus to come 
and rescue us out of here. Mm. No, but we are to put on the whole armor of God. And onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. We are to go out and proclaim him as Lord, and to do great things in his name. And the people that do know their God shall do great exploits for his honor, for his glory. And only then are we the Apostle Paul's answer to his prayer that his people, that God's people, would be filled with joy and peace and would abound in the hope of a victorious eschatology. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the promises of the Word of God. Father, help us to capture this idea. Help us to trust in your promises. Help us to know that our labor for you is not in vain, but that you are victorious in time and in history. Lord, I believe that when this whole world is all said and done, and you are ruling presently and visibly with your saints, I believe that we will be able to look back on this world as a stage for the drama of your glory. Mm. And Father, I pray that I would be one of your characters that was in some way able to glorify you and shed forth the majesty of your name. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to do a work for thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.